Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, session with Hannes Putik, the Managing Director of Mr. Wolf Consulting, and you're here to see marketing and communication in a collapsed market. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Let's, uh, let's move on. So I'm the Mar Managing Director of Mr. Wolf. We are a mission-driven marketing consultancy. We are a startup, but we operate in a wider context. We are a subsidiary of the Fock Dams Group, uh, which is a big event agency out of Germany. We are a team of six people now in, in Berlin. And the wider Fock Dams Group, of course, uh, maybe some of you know, uh, know the group, uh, is a lot bigger, more than 250 employees at the moment, 15 offices. So we are a strategy department within, uh, within a, a event agency, basically. So we know a lot uh, what has been going on over the last few days and weeks. And uh, yeah, and I basically have seen this market collapse, the, the event market. Um, we are, uh, as everybody is, in crisis mode. And I think that uh, this is uh, very important to understand that this is a crisis. Uh, it's a global pandemic, but for uh, in terms of the economic impact, it definitely is a crisis. I'm 100% sure that there will be a recession coming. We see this from, from many, many sources. I like to point more to the qualitative sources, not only the numbers and, and quantitative uh, key performance indicator that point towards a recession, but um, also the, the little qualitative uh, feelings that you get for example, by just looking at a picture like this, uh, this is from the, from the New York Times, uh, from a New York Times article, a recent one. And this is a very senior Wall Street broker, right? A Wall Street trader. He has seen everything you, you can imagine. Uh, he has uh, seen the global recession following the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, and, and look uh, how he's doing. Um, so th this is a very, very... Uh, urgent risk that we all face, um, especially in the event market. I think no other market was hit um, like the event market, besides maybe travel industry, the, the aviation industry and, and so on. But um, I don't have to tell you um, a lot more because you're all in this situation now. Uh, and, and there are some, as I said, some qualitative uh, factors when I look at pictures like this, but also some, some quantitative ones. Uh, I think you have seen the jobless claims uh, out of the US, um, which is now, I mean, figures like 6 million people per week. So 33 million people are unemployed currently um, or, or claimed to be jobless uh, in the US uh, and this will definitely lead to a, to a global recession. So the question is how to do marketing communication in, in a world like this. So what to do in, terms of, in times of crisis when you are at a job like, like we are as, as marketeers, as salespeople, as working in the industry and trying to provide services to clients. So um, there is this question of what to do after the collapse. And there is a distinct order in which I want to uh, get to, uh, to, the, to the core of it. So there is a first step and there is a second step and there is a third step and you should do them in directly this order. But we, before we get into what to do after the collapse and in which order, I would like to point out to a very important, uh, I'd like to point out a very important thing is that there is a before the collapse. You should do something before a market collapse. And I mean, by now it's too late, but I want to share anyway. Uh, there is this moment when the shit hits the fan. I think you all heard this expression, the shit hits the fan. And there is definitely uh, maybe a, a step zero, a step zero that you should do before the shit hits the fan. And uh, this is basically um, very, very simple. These are just basic things that you can do before the shit hits the fan. Um, it's the old parable. Uh, I don't know if you have heard it about the ant and the grasshopper. Uh, if you're not familiar, this is a wonderful illustration of a Walt Disney cartoon uh, of this very old 6,000 year old fable. Um, and uh, it's the ants working all summer and being productive and, and uh, having some savings. And then it's the grasshopper coming along and saying, hey, do you want to make music? It's, uh, it's such a nice weather. And the ant says, no, I have to work. And the grasshopper 
um, is like, no, I'm better off making music and enjoying myself during summer. But when the winter comes, of course, the ants can celebrate because they have their savings. During hard times, they can enjoy their meals and have everything. And the grasshopper, he's slowly dying because he did not save up anything. So uh, this old fable uh, is definitely illustration of what uh, is happening right now with companies who lived as ants and who lived as grasshoppers. Um, so my urge to you is don't, just don't be a grasshopper, of course. Um, and I mean this in three ways. Um, you have to build it before you need it. You have to build cash reserves. You have to build client relationships. And you have to be a building a social media following before the shit hits the fan. Um, this is very basic, but uh, this is one of my idols, uh, LeBron James, um, who when asked, what made you so special? He said, I'm not doing anything special. I'm not doing anything special. I'm just consistent with the process. Right? And, and this was very uh, interesting to me. So it's not about doing something special. It's about doing the normal stuff, the basic stuff, doing this consistently. So cash reserves, client relationships, and social media following. Let's just quickly, very quickly go into all of those three. When it comes to cash reserves, I, heard, I hear so many people uh, at companies talking about we need higher profit distribution at the year and uh, we need higher dividends. Uh, we need to, um, uh, let's do a stock buyback or let's put the focus on the shareholder value. The term that I love most is we have to put the excess cash to work. But what we see now during a crisis is that the people who have saved up some cash who have, um, yeah, basically have some cash reserves, they are really um, coming out of this uh, corona crisis and also they will come out of the global recession very well. Whereas the people who lived as grasshoppers, they, um, they are really, really, um, yeah, fucked, if I can say that. So um, how, much should you, should you actually, um, how much should you actually save up? Uh, I think there is no clear, clear answer to that. Uh, usually some sources say you should save up three months of uh, costs uh, in, in your cash reserve. Some people say six months of cash in your cost reserve, uh, six months of uh, costs in your cash reserve. I talked to a, I talked to a very senior uh, chief financial officer who said for himself, not for the company, but for himself, he saved up to seven years of his own cash. Imagine how well you sleep uh, when, you have, when you can live your normal life for seven years and there's no income for seven years, but you can live your normal life. Um, so I urge you, this is the first thing that you should do before the market collapse, build a cash reserve and better start now um, building that. Secondly, uh, the second one was the uh, direct personal client relationships. Uh, and I hear a lot of people say, I'm an introvert. Uh, my client reads our company newsletter. I don't have to get into a personal contact. Uh, sales will talk to the client. There, I have too many meetings anyway. My favorite quote is, I hate networking. I'm not a networking guy. So um, again, make personal client relationships an absolute priority, even if you don't like networking, right? If you are in a responsible uh, position at a company, it's not about what you like or what you don't like or what type of uh, person you are. If you're more introvert or extrovert, you should definitely make personal client, uh, client relationships a priority because if you don't have them, you will lose during this, um, during this uh, global recession. Thirdly, uh, the online audience, uh, the digital, uh, the social media following. A lot of people say, I'm not digital savvy, I'm not an influencer, my life is not interesting, and I don't want to overshare, right? People don't want to overshare on, on professional networking sites like LinkedIn or in Germany, it's Xing. Um, and, and some people say social media is not important for B2B businesses at all. I don't need to share anything. And this could not be further from the truth. This is so wrong. You should definitely build an online audience before shit hits the fan because then you can activate this online audience um, after the shit hits the fan. Um, you can uh, activate this online audience and really uh, move 
very, very fast into a digital uh, distribution channel and digital uh, way of communicating with your, with your um, target group. This is distinct from the personal relationships because you don't have to have a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with every member of your online audience, but you should be able to, speech to, a, uh, to speak to a following um, that, is, uh, that has been built over weeks, months, or years. So build it before you need it, cash reserves, client relationships, and social media following. But of course, there is no glory in prevention. That's a famous quote uh, here in Germany now after uh, our chief virologist uh, said it, there is no glory in prevention. And you all want to know from me what we can do after the fact, right? After the shit hits the fan. So after you hopefully build it before you need it, you can follow three distinct uh, steps. First, keep breathing and think clearly. It's really important. You have to build your communication strategy uh, by thinking clearly and not being overly hyped or I have to, I have to uh, act, I have to act and, and send out random emails to, to clients, right? So keep breathing, think clearly. Secondly, provide information and very important, orientation. You have to provide orientation. And thirdly, experiment, test, and learn. So let's go through all of those three steps. And this is important in that order. Uh, you have to go through these steps and I want to give you some, some background uh, for each of the steps. Keep breathing and think clearly. You all have seen this, um, this picture. You have to help yourself first before you help others. That's the main message, right? If you are dead, you cannot help others. If you are hyperventilating, if you are paralyzed by a, a crisis like the corona crisis, you will be not able as a leader to help uh, your, your team or, or your customers. So this is a seven step process. Be fully present, empty your mind of preconception, take your time, sit quietly to reflect, and then uh, uh, ask for advice, weigh this against the counsel of your own convictions, and then deliver it without being paralyzed. It's really important. And it's at the very basis, it's a leadership moment. This is a picture of the Roman Senate and the Romans were really, really smart because they had a Senate, they had democracy whenever there were peaceful times. But in times of crisis, the Romans elected a dictator as it was called back then without the negative connotation that we now uh, have. But the dictator was over, just for a certain amount of time, he was the supreme leader and he could do whatever he wanted because it is necessary to move fast in times like this. So this is definitely a leadership moment. Don't try in times of crisis, try to flesh out your communication strategy with the whole team and get everybody on board. You as the leader should be the central figure and give directions in the times of crisis. You should explain and you should always uh, try to, to, to ask for counsel and explain your decisions, but you should definitely act and don't wait. Second, provide information and orientation. And the very important thing about this is that you have a cascaded approach. Don't do everything at once. Uh, we have identified uh, five things that you should do. You should first inform and orient yourself. We already talked about this, right? Think clearly. There's a great concept of two circles, the two circles, the circle of concern um, and the circle of influence. And you should not think about the circle of concern, right? You should only think about your circle of influence. Where do I have influence on? What can I do? And make a, a war plan for yourself. Then only, secondly, you um, then go to employees and the team and inform them. Don't go first to the customers or to key partners. I have seen so many um, CEOs, uh, CMOs made this mistake that the first email they sent out after Corona hit was to the customers. And that is so wrong because the employees, they want to be informed and they are multiplicators in your messaging. So you should be really crystal clear that the first priority are the employees. And then only come customers and maybe some key partners, force other partners, and only then you talk to investors and other stakeholders. So this cascaded approach is really, really central and the core of your communication and should be the core of your communication strategy. 
Uh, and then uh, a word regarding email. This is um, uh, Jen Say, uh, the CMO of Levi's. She said, no one wants to get a bunch of emails from brands and stores saying what they are doing. It's spam. And that really is. So be very, very crystal clear in your messaging towards your customers um, and, and in your communication strategy. And don't overshare there, right? Um, overshare maybe on social media, but not with emails. And I've seen so many lengthy emails from CMOs, from hotel chain brands and whatsoever who explain on, I don't know, one, two, three page long emails when you would print it out, what they are trying to do and what uh, helped them and what not and so on. I found this funny treat. Corona has really made me realize how many corporate emails I need to unsubscribe from. Uh, one best practice example that stood out for me was uh, the Delta CEO. As I said, the aviation industry was hit maybe even harder than the event industry, which is now shifting to, towards virtual events and hybrid events uh, and, and doing just uh, yeah, yeah, doing the same stuff, but virtually, but you cannot virtually fly, right? Delta, I think, has only 5% of their uh, visitors, uh, of their guests um, on the planes. And Ed Bastian, the CEO, he wrote a very good email, which is very, very short. Um, and, and basically, he's, he was really, really honest, really candid. And he said that um, it will happen uh, that people will travel again, but Delta will be a much smaller airline and that the recovery period could take two to three years. So really honest uh, in, his, uh, in his messaging. And uh, he differentiated between three steps. And I think this could be a learning also in your crisis communication when you have uh, such crisis. He said, we have prepared, and he outlined everything that they have prepared, a, a war uh, website where he said, this is our dark website that we only... Uh, that we only go live with when something like this happens and everything that they've prepared. Secondly, we have learned, that was really interesting, um, uh, what they have learned during times of Ebola and stuff like this, he outlined this. And then thirdly, we've taken action and he outlined very briefly what the action was that uh, Delta was taking. So you should include all of those three aspects in your, in your communication and in your messaging during times of crisis. And lastly, experiment, test, and learn. I just want to go very briefly over this. Um, this is the time where you can actually do experiments, right? That's the great thing because what normally works in a given market does not work anymore. So you are totally free to come up with new stuff. Uh, for ourselves, for example, we uh, came up with new target group personas uh, for Mr. Wolf, for our uh, customers for our clients on a strategic level, we founded some new target group personas, right? The fact checkers, which are now checking every facts and, and so on after they uh, are used to work with data uh, during Corona times. Or on a more, more operational level, we have seen so much, so much um, digital stuff, Instagram flash sales of companies who were previously just old school brick and mortar companies who are now using Instagram to really do those uh, fast paced flash sales and actually do more sales than with their traditional methods. You should commit and follow through, check the facts, um, check your options, the risks and benefits, and then make a decision, execute, and then only check again. Last slide from my side, a quote from Seneca, one of my favorites. I judge you unfortunate because you have never lived through misfortune. You have passed through life without an opponent. No one can ever know what you're capable of, not even you. So make use of Corona. Uh, see it as an opponent where you can, at the end, wear it as a badge of honor. I survived with my business. I survived Corona. I came up with a good communication plan and communication strategy. And this was really uh, a story that I can now tell. I hope that for you. If you need any help, please give us a call. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And if we have time, we can now move to some questions, if you have some. Do you have a sort of blueprint for when, uh, what to do? You know, if you're a small company in the meetings, events, incentive travel industry, and you want to jump in and, and, and take some of the actions that you were talking about, what, what's the plan? You know, we talked a lot about, you know, what's not the plan and being honest, but is there a sort of specific structure that you would advise or any specific point to start that planning? 
Yeah, good question. I, I think um, that's a typical consultancy answer, but I would have to say it depends. It always depends. So the structure that I would give is the threefold structure that I outlined, right? Keep calm, breathe, and come up with a plan before you act. Then only go into the cascaded communication approach where you inform first your employees, then blah, 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 everything that I outlined. And then thirdly, Certainly you can try to make the best out of the situation, experiment and learn. When you go into the details, um, and when you go into the details, it very much depends on the industry um, and, uh, and on the situation, right? What did you do before the market collapsed, right? Have you saved up some cash so you're able to live through, through six months without revenue? Or do you have to create some, some revenue? Um, uh, whether this uh, is right or wrong for you, it depends on the individual. There was a question here from Stephen Wade about how can you communicate around security privacy concerns with virtual events? Anything you can say about that? Oh, that's, this is definitely a big, uh, big topic in Germany, uh, as the Germans are so security and privacy. Um, uh, I, I think uh, um, you, you, you would ha have to look at the uh, individual event. If you plan and right? Um, then you don't, maybe a couple of times you don't need to um, have specific profiles and work with this is this person and this is this person. So you have this anonymous crowd that you can give the experience and it's totally fine for them and also for you in terms of data collection. If you work in a more uh, B2B setting and you really want to have the information, then I would definitely uh, differentiate between two different uh, maybe levels, logical levels. The first one, what is legally allowed? Uh, and, uh, and this is in Germany, sometimes stricter than in other parts of the world, uh, but you should obviously comply with that. And then on the other hand, on the other logical level, it would be what is morally okay. So we are working uh, at Mr. Wolf and at Fog Dams. Um, we're definitely working with a lot of uh, interesting projects and, and clients where, where we implement uh, virtual events and where it's, always this uh, discussion, what can we actually get? Which data points, uh, which data diamonds can we collect? And, um, and we always say, uh, comply with the law and then don't be afraid of asking and, um, and having a disclaimer, this is what we collect. People are usually much, uh, much more okay. So no problem with just saying, this is what we, what we do and this is the data that we collect and we collect it to get to know you better in your opinion. Stephen uh, in the chat uh, clarified the question a little bit more, maybe just one, uh, one minute. Um, it's about doing a frontal webinar, right, where people cannot interact or do distinct networking formats. And I hear a lot of people saying, well, you cannot do networking virtually. But you can, you can. There are certain formats that work really, really well. What we are implementing, for example, for one client right now is a speed dating, right? Where you have, uh, maybe you know, you remember the days of chat roulette, where, <laughs> where you are randomly connected to a stranger via your webcam. In a B2B setting, of course, you would need to make this connected towards, uh, uh, connected with a topic that you can discuss, right? And you would have a, maybe a countdown at the lower right-hand side of your, of your screen, a countdown counting down, and then you get shuffled to the next person that you talk with regarding this topic. Uh, and that you talk um, uh, topics through. And then you would develop topics, but you also develop relationships. And I have seen virtual events that we implemented where people go out and said, I talk to more people and get to know more attendees than during the live event. So it is possible, but it's all the time you have to think about the format. It's not about the tool. Usually tools are uh, exchangeable, but it's about the format and you need to uh, think long and hard about what's the right format to achieve what, what goals you, you have.